she said she asked a question of what could she do to have a closer relationship with her husband. And Aphrodite said to her, uh, don't wear socks in bed. <laughs> Welcome to Worth Quoting, a program sponsored by the Open Campus of Florida Community College at Jacksonville. With us today, we have somebody worth quoting. In fact, one of the muses, and we'll talk about that, Agape Stanisopoulos, who is a Greek and uh, now living in the United States doing wonderful things as an actress, producer, and soon-to-be author. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Thank you, Carol. It's lovely to be with you. Lovely to have you. I'm intrigued by your name. Can you talk about the word agape and uh, what it means? Agape means love in Greek, and uh, the Greeks had four kinds of love. They had um, agape, which is the highest form of love. It's called the unconditional love, brotherly love. Actually, it's quoted in the Oxford Dictionary as the love that God has for man, love with no conditions. And eros was the erotic love uh, between the sexes, and it would be the, the love that is a little more basic. <laughs> and uh, philia. Uh, which is the term for friendship, and charity, which is uh, charity, which is more of a universal love, doing good for others. That's wonderful. That's and amazing. We, we need a little bit of all of them. We do. A little bit of all of them. Right. Well, you are, you are talking about the mysterious lives of the women, the, the goddesses. Right. And mm. I'd like to know how you got into that. I mean, by Greek, by being a Greek, you yes, must have been. Of course, mission. I was raised with them all around me. You know, from school, from looking at them from my bedroom window, from the Parthenon. Mm -hmm. We lived very close, and there they were, staring at me every day. Uh, and I learned from the school, but it was much later, Carol, when I came to the United States, that I, my sister, was writing a book about the gods and goddesses of Greece. And I got very involved in uh, their more esoteric ways and their archetypes, what they really represent. And they became much more alive in me, and I realized they were much more alive everywhere I looked. And of course, Carl Jung, the psychologist, talked a lot about the archetypes. And then when I was in drama school in London, because from Greece I went to London, I studied drama, when I was doing plays and when I was rehearsing and I would do different kinds of plays from Chekhov to the Greeks uh, to Shakespeare, I realized that these characters, these different kinds of women, were actually these archetypes. And different women in the plays manifested different qualities, just like the Greek goddesses. So between my Greek background, the theater background, and the psychology, it kind of all came together in this evening that I do, talking about the different goddesses, but really how they relate within ourselves. Well, that's fascinating. You're writing a book called Living the Goddess, mm -hmm. Seven Principles Embracing Female Consciousness. That's right. And um, that's exactly what that's going to be about. It's going to be about really empowering women in realizing that these different aspects, these different goddesses, are part of ourselves. And we all have them. It's just like, if you imagine like a big spectrum, and each one is a part of the pie, and uh, until we give them voice, until each one of them becomes a reality within our own consciousness, within our own psyche, we're really not quite feeling all the way there. It's almost like a part of us might be a little dormant, a little bit asleep. And it doesn't mean that women have to go act out every part, but just to be aware that all parts are there. So you're saying maybe that this is subconscious and you're trying to make it more conscious. More conscious, exactly. And be more, in that way, if we're more conscious of them, then we're more empowered. Oh, great. Okay, well, let's start with, with one of these at least. All right. Well, obviously the most favorite one of all is Aphrodite. Uh, not necessarily, I love her, but there may, all of them are wonderful. Aphrodite, Venus the goddess of love and beauty and passion and sensuality, freedom, 
and she comes to really bring to us her gift of abandonment centrality. And the, the, what I love about her is it's not just that she expresses it in male-female relationships, but you know the kind of aspect that Aphrodite gives us is the eros with life. It's really when a woman uh, manifests that part of herself, she feels beautiful about herself in no matter what she does. It's the way she may lay a table, the way she may put the flowers, the way she dresses, the way she is with herself and with her life around her. She has the sense of beauty about who she is. And uh, obviously in relationships, she's very free in her relationships with the men, and she brings that alive in them. I mean, she created wars. You know, <laughs> Helen of Troy is a typical Aphrodite. She actually created the Trojan War between the Greeks and um, the Trojans. Mm -hmm. So she was the cause of it. And um, Cleopatra would be another wonderful um, example of Aphrodite. Marilyn Monroe, mm -hmm. a modern Aphrodite. And are these one-dimensional people? You're saying everybody's got a spectrum. Right. But you're pulling out some people yes, who who are more manifesting that mm -hmm. that archetype exactly. Um, then let's see, uh, Demeter, the goddess, the mother goddess, the earth mother, the goddess of the grain, and she is the part of ourselves that is the nurturer. And anybody who has this calling to be a mother from a very young age, a lot of women might feel this tremendous calling to have children, that would be the Demeter archetype. That would be the Demeter uh, uh, goddess calling you. Uh, What's the, gr the Roman equivalent of that one? Demeter. Let me think. No, it doesn't come uh, right away okay. of what, what, is, what is the name of Demeter. I don't have to look into that. Okay. Um, then we have she's not as famous as it certainly yes. Aphrodite is and Venus. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, then we have Hestia, which is um, the, the goddess of the hearth. And uh, she's called Vesta. And Hestia is one of my favorite goddesses. And I'll tell you why. She's the only Greek goddess, first of all, that did not have a statue because she's essence. She is essence. essence. Oh. She's really the essence of warmth and centeredness. And her symbol is the flame, the, the fire, the hearth. And the Greeks used to honor her by having a, a in Delphi, they would keep the flame lit on 24 hours. And she's the one who is honored in the home. But what she teaches us, and what today we can use her for, is she teaches us how to transform the mundane into the sacred. Because Hestia is about sacredness. And she really tells us that she's not about relationships. She's more about the relationship with everything in a sacred way. And it would be like if you were having an intimate moment with a friend or your husband or your uh, the man you're in a relationship with or if you're having a just a moment of sacredness with somebody in front of a fireplace and there is no big fanfare or anything it's just that sacred moment that is so precious and we've all felt that in our lives that would be a very much of a Hestia quality and striving to have more of Hestia is something that's very empowering to women because if we do not have Hestia in our lives, we feel off center, we feel off base, we feel a little bit out of sorts. She's really the center of, of, our, of our soul, you know. Hmm. That's fascinating. Uh, then, okay, we've named our three of them. And the other thing I wanted to tell you is that Vesta, it's interesting, the um, Vest, the actual Vest, the word Vest comes from that origin because Vest is to protect when we wear a Vest or investment mm -hmm. has the word vest in it vesta as well it's about protection it's about security then we have uh, Athena Minerva and Athena uh, if you probably know she was born out of Zeus's head mm -hmm. Zeus had a very bad headache one day and his head split open and out came Athena fully armored fully clothed, very unlike Aphrodite, who was born naked out of the sea foam. And she's really on the other side of the spectrum, symbolizing uh, wisdom, intellect. She's the goddess of civilization. She's definitely the goddess of the city. She's the protectress of the city. And she 
is very devoid of relationship with men in an erotic way. She's much more um, devoted to having friends with men, having friendships. She's the uh, goddess of Ulysses throughout um, Homer's Ulysses and the Iliad. She whispers to him encouraging words to make it home to Ithaca. She's the goddess of uh, Hercules, of Achilles, all the heroes. She just right there stands by them. So and she's their advisor? Their advisor, exactly. Yeah, so she's the businesswoman, maybe, of the yes, Greek goddesses? Yes, the businesswoman. The, um, she's, um, she's the kind of woman who a lot of women today who become uh, legal counselors, who become heads of organizations, head of schools, are very much Athenas. Hmm. Is there a male equivalent of a, an Athena in mythology for, uh, for, for Greece? Yes, well, Apollo, I think, has a lot of those qualities. Apollo is very much a protect, uh, protector of the arts and architect and science. And uh, he's also a little bit devoid of relationships with uh, women. Mm -hmm. He doesn't get on with women. I mean, he wants to, but he never quite makes it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but Athena is known for her intellect, isn't she? Yes. Exactly, mm -hmm. the intellect, very much, because, you know, if you think about the symbols, she comes out of intelligence. Mm -hmm. And uh, she's the part of ourselves that we can call forward any time. If, you, if we, as women, if we have a problem, it's, it never fails. If you just close your eyes and you ask Athena to speak through you, the higher part of ourselves, the wise part in us, and don't block it, she will always tell you how to solve it. She's a problem solver. So and the problem can, solver of you is your own Athena. That's yes, and she can totally talk to us if we access her, if we call her forth. It's the wise part of ourselves. Is it intuition or is it some other part? I think it's both. I, I think it's both. I think it's intuition is definitely acts uh, as a part there. But I think there's a part of us that is very wise if we could just access it. We never have to go to psychics anymore. <laughs> <laughs> do your own. Do your own. <laughs> Who else is in so, there? Well, who else do we need to know about? We are Artemis. Mm -hmm. I call her my Nike goddess because she loves the sports and she is the uh, lover of the woods and wild nature. And her, the bow and arrow is her symbol. And um, she's the one who, uh, as a woman, enjoys sporty clothes, no makeup totally into sports, totally into nature, wants to be alone. Again, her relationship with uh, men is very alien. She doesn't, her relationship is more with herself, with nature, very soulful. And uh, a lot of women who aspire, like Amelia Earhart would be a, a typical Artemis because women who have that archetype much more predominant in them tend to be adventurous, tend to start new, new uh, adventures, um, the wanting to fly, of course, would be a very Artemisian quality. Jane Goodall, who did all the work with the apes, that would be a typical Artemis. While in Athena, there would be um, Sandra Day O'Connor would be a typical, Madeleine Albright. They would be more like Athena types. I see. Who else is, do we want to talk about? Uh, so we have Aphrodite, Demeter, uh, Ceres, I just remember her name, her Latin ah. name, Ceres, C-E-R-E-S, Ceres, which is the, um, actually uh, in Latin is symbolized with the wheat. Uh, Aphrodite, uh, Demeter, uh, Hestia, Hera, uh, Athena, Artemis, and Persephone. Okay. Persephone, Persephone. the daughter of uh, Demeter, and uh, she's really the goddess of the underworld. You know, in the myth, She's abducted by Hades, and the earth splits open, and Hades just draws her down and by eating the pomegranate, the seed of the pomegranate. And she's really the part of herself who is um, very free to start with and really doesn't want any responsibilities. She's very th much the young part in herself, the girl. And then in her transformation, in going under, she awakens to become fully grown and to become a full woman, she has to undergo through this transformation. And women who are Persephone's tend to be very much into the spiritual sides of life. Um, they might be drawn to be more on the religious side. There's a very spiritual aspect or 
a lot of self-help women who write about uh, assisting women to become um, more connected with themselves would be very much a Persephone type. So part of what she does is she comes back and brings the spring. That's right, exactly. And she back, uh, she goes under. She goes. She almost becomes like winter time. Winter time, and then comes back and brings the spring. Mm -hmm. But it's through the integration that she becomes uh, transformed into herself. It's through this process of, uh, in a way, it's like sandpapering, or in a way, it's like um, uh, uh, sandpapering. What do you call the process when a diamond to become a diamond? Is it? A it's pressure. Yeah, it's pressure, and to clean the diamond. Mm -hmm. You have to go through this process. Mm -hmm. They also say, uh, when I was visiting some vineyards in Greece, they said to me that the best um, vine is the grape. It's the one that grows against the stone because it has some pressure and it's difficult to grow. But then when it grows, it's the most juicy and the most tasty. Mm. So it seems like sometimes with adversities in our lives, we become more more of who we are. Mm -hmm. More fully human. More fully human. The other metaphor I think is um, the pearl when you get the you know the irritant and then it's, it's coated and coated and becomes out this beautiful exactly. pure thing. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Well these things these. are alien to most Americans these Greek goddesses and even the archetype idea. Yes. How do you help people apply that to their lives? Well this is what the book is going to be about. I, I have taken we take them historically and give them the story of the myth. And then we look at who have the women been throughout history who have been those kind of archetypes. And then by telling a little bit about their story, then we become more aware of uh, who, who those types were. And then we have like a workbook in this book that I'm writing, which is really about um, what kind of things would a woman do in order to become more aware of those aspects of herself. So it's like if you wanted to bring more your Aphrodite, first of all, you would look at how one is brought up and what kind of judgments there are around maybe in Aphrodite. Aphrodite has been very judged by our society uh, as too loose, too free, no commitment. And uh, so therefore, a lot of us may tend to suppress that part of ourselves. So we would look back and see how where are the judgments against those parts of ourselves? And by just becoming aware of them, uh, we bring them to life. And then it's like, in a way, I call it, Carol, it's like giving ourselves permission to have those voices. And it's like creating a place within our own consciousness or where we allow those parts to speak to us. And they do. Uh, I remember I was doing a workshop once, and. Uh, we were doing a guided meditation of how to get in touch with our Aphrodite. And a woman said, ask the question. Oh, and it was all silent, and then everybody was writing. And when it came time to share what people had found out, she said she asked the question of what could she do to have a closer relationship with her husband. And Aphrodite said to her, uh, don't wear socks in bed. <laughs> Now, wouldn't that be just total paradise? <laughs> I mean, I would have never thought of that. But sure enough, this was a woman who had really, you know, maybe cut off that part of herself and was more on the factional way of sleeping rather than being the romantic part of having her husband more being her lover. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was just a very small little tip, but I never forgot it. And it would be playing soft music. It would be, you know, Aphrodite loves oils and baths and senses and perfumes and satin sheets and beautiful fabrics. So it's very sensual, it's bringing that sensuality alive. So in the book, we will use a lot of those little tips and the meditations, the going back to your childhood. And there, it's right there. It's like if, if we look back of how we were brought up, all of us were encouraged to be more of one aspect than another. How were the women, the, the goddesses, perceived? How are, are they perceived by the Greeks then and now? I mean, now these, this was a religion at one point. Now it's yes, a mythology. Yes, of course, it's changed. Uh -huh. you, know, you mean in my country? Do yes. you mean specifically in yes. my country? Yes. How are women treated? Are, do, are they given as much power, status, and that kind of thing as these goddesses seem to portray? I think uh, in Greece, definitely, there is a change, uh, like everywhere else. And you know, if you, 
if we talk about Greece again, it's like it would be the difference between Athens and a Greek village. Because Athens is a cosmopolitan city, a lot of women nowadays go abroad, they study, and they come back, and they come back, you know, filled with a lot of knowledge and, uh, and leadership. So that definitely women are allowed to take a lot more place in society and build their own boundaries. Now, if you talk to a Greek vi village girl, she probably has an arranged marriage. She probably has to marry somebody her parents really want. And the taboos and the held back of women is very much uh, alive there. And you know, women there are not really given a lot of opportunities to excel or to become their own person. It's still very much a patriarchal society. I mean, it's the same in Italy, I'm sure, and in Spain. I mean, there's a lot of that Mediterranean cultures that, uh, and, and I think, yeah, it's amazing that culturally we still have a long way to go for women to become more of equal partners with men. But I, I always look at it, Carol, that I, I don't look at it as uh, fighting with men or being one up or, I think if we as women empower ourselves in who we are, we will take the steps necessary and it's almost men will have to give us the right to become who we are because it's more like a statement, making a statement of who you are, then you're not fought because you're stating it, you're affirming it. If you're fighting for it, and I think women's liberation did that, but I think we're at a new stage, and the new stage is affirming it, stating it, and then by, the, by your right, I think we will find that we will start collectively, we will start changing the way men and society is um, for us. But we have to constantly state, in, state our boundaries. Do women resist parts of themselves because they're threatening to either men or other people? Um, or do you need all pieces of these archetypes to be a whole person? I think it depends uh, on, again, what is the main point of, exp what it is that we want to express. And I think a lot of times women who are out there in the world fighting in a man's world or uh, being part of a man's world, that would be more like the Athena types, let's say, uh, might find for themselves that they might be cutting off a part of them in order to function in that world. Do you know what I mean? It's like if you are going to function uh, as, a politi as a politician and be a woman, I I as a career woman, uh, not necessarily I mean, we're not talking all the way around because there are definitely exceptions. That uh, definitely, there are a lot of women who can have manifested being both feminine and being excellent in a man's world. So it's not being masculine; it's being the more, um, more like the Greek goddesses and having all those aspects of yourself. Yes, I mean, but if you look at Donna Karen, um, Ira um, von Fürstenberg, I mean, women who have just totally excelled. There's so many women, as the Lauder, who've excelled. But what world have they excelled? The world of making, it's really not in the world of Aphrodite. But if we were to name how many women uh, are in Congress, how many women are senators? We never had a woman president, of course. Um, so if you look at that domain, or how many women are principals of colleges and universities, that is definitely we're in the minority. So I think, but women who've excelled in Aphrodite's world, they're definitely, mm -hmm. so it's, it's more like integration. That's why I would look at it. It's like integrating all aspects and not uh, leaving any behind or no unconscious. No parts of yourself undiscovered or un, un what, developed. I, and exactly, and I, so like I, it's, I call it like the process of unearthing oneself. So it's all there. It's all there. And I think the goddesses is just another tool. It's like a tool. It's not the end in itself. Um, I think if, if anything, and in the heart of my book, it's really about that the goddess is really about the heart. Because when you have the heart alive, when the heart is awakened, when the flame is in, the, in your heart as a woman, then, then you really feel complete and whole. So that all this is very well as a way of exploration. But it's sometimes, you know, it's almost like when you're climbing up a ladder uh, and you, you have to get to the top.
then you don't need the ladder. You can throw it away. It's like This is like a tool or you need a rope to get up. But then you let go of the rope and the ladder because you've arrived. And I think ultimately having that heart of the goddess or the female spirit, the feminine spirit alive in us, then I think that is to me the most powerful tool for, uh, for anything. Well, we'll have to end on that because this certainly is a celebration of women with all of your bringing the Greeks sort of full circle back yes. up at this point. So we wish you the best on the book. Thank you so much. And all the things that you've shared with us. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. This is me. Carol Spaulding with the Open Campus at Florida Community College. And we have Agape Stasinopoulos who is going to produce this book and has shared a lot of things about the Greek gods. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. Yasu. <laughs> <laughs>